Uh, my name is Mary Lloyd Ireland. I'm an orthopedic surgeon practicing at the University of Kentucky in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and Sports Medicine. I have had a passion and done a lot of research over the last 30 years in ACL injuries in females. This includes prevention, how to better perform reconstructions, and when to let individuals go back to play safely without risk of re-injury. This talk was given at the Kentucky Orthopedic Society and is entitled ACL Injuries in Females, Sex Differences and Similarities. Thank you for your attention. This is my website where this and other videos are posted. So please visit this and I hope this helps you. I have nothing to disclose. At our Orthopedic Academy in 2016, I was involved in a symposium on sex and sports caring for the female athlete ACL injuries. Soon this will be published in the journal of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. We also had a poster on sex-based considerations in caring for common sports injuries. This was sponsored by the Women's Health Issues Advisory Board, which I have been a member of. WEAB seeks to advocate, advance, and serve as a resource on sex and gender differences in musculoskeletal health. I would suggest that you go to that website if you're interested or take care of female athletes and want to know more about the unique sex differences that occur in active females and female athletes. So 30 years after appreciating non-contact ACL injuries were higher rates in basketball, what progress have we really made? The lower right is Cheryl Miller, who tore both of her ACLs while playing at the University of Southern California. If she wasn't able to play, she was a great spirit and support, getting water bottles out, doing what she could to help the team. Sex-based considerations in caring for common sports injuries. Basketball team handball significantly increased risk of injury. This article by Renstrom and others shows these increases in female sports, particularly team handball, as shown on the right. In the U.S., the NCAA used to have an injury registry where they would poll 16% of athletic trainers of the schools. And these are the results. So basketball is up here on the top. The blue is male. Red is female. And so over this period of 15 years, ending in 2004, you can see how the, the rates kind of bounced around. But the average rate of women to men ACL injuries is 338 in basketball, and soccer shown below is 2.75. Still a significant increase rate of ACL tears. Most of these are non-contact. Despite over the, these years, prevention strategies and programs for performance enhancement, better lower extremity movement patterns were all instituted. Mechanism of injury, there's no real sex differences in these mechanisms. It's a weight-bearing pivot shift. So where does she tear her ACL in which one of these four diagrams? Most likely it's in the third one. When it starts looking ugly, that's when it's subluxed out of place and is probably already torn. This is not a straight valgus, but it's a varum mechanism, valgus rotation out of control movement pattern for the injury. The player on the right grabs the ball, tears her ACL in the paint. 
The heart attack of the knee is this, where they draw their knee up to their chest and start screaming. So you can see here where she's in a valgus collapse position. She is out of the cone of stability of her knee. She actually has had three ACL tears. A lot of things happen in basketball in the paint. They're trying to come down, stop, keep from going out of bounds, grab the ball, put it back up. So she tears her ACL. This injury occurred when she wasn't thinking, just taking the ball out of bounds. She tears her ACL, puts all of her body weight there, and you can see again she's out of the cone of stability. Her knee is not under her body. Boom. That same type mechanism that you saw in the paint in the last basketball player. Sometimes it's when you're not prepared and you're not in that tennis get ready position, which unfortunately we can't be in all sports. We teach athletes to land in a safe position and avoid that position as shown in the third ply of this diagram. So we teach them a position of safety. Position of safety versus position of no return. The position of safety is shown on the left, and that's more with the hips and knees more flexed. The body alignment is hip over knee over ankle. The back is normal lordosis. Basically, the position of safety is like a tennis get ready position. It's with the hips flexed, knees flexed, tibias in neutral, landing on both feet and balanced. This position or out of control, if you think about it diagrammatically, the body is forward, rotated to the opposite side, the pelvis is anteriorly rotated, the hip is adducted and internal rotated, they land in a more upright position, the knee is less flexed, valgus position, tibia is external, landing more on one foot in an out-of-control movement. The foot typically is pronated and everted. That's the position you want to avoid. There are multiple factors resulting in ACL injuries. These are not modifiable or modifiable. Fortunately, in expert think tanks that I've been involved with, the conclusions are that modifiable factors are most important. We must emphasize modifiable factors for return to play and prevention programs. Anatomic sex, dif sex differences in the knee. There are no sex differences in notch shape and size. Smaller notches house smaller ligaments. And a smaller ligament, you would think commonsensically, would be weaker. Biomechanics experts don't necessarily tell us that, but the notch is formed in relation to the size of the ACL. This is not a sex issue. It's more of a size issue. Males or females can have smaller ACLs and hit smaller notches. Tibial slope on sagittal measures, normal is 10 degrees posterior. Greater posterior slope is a risk factor for ACL injury. Size of ligament, you'd think smaller ligaments are more apt to tear. Also, we'll need to look at femoral condyle size and shape. On the left of this slide, cadaveric specimens show very interesting things about the notch. In the upper left, congenital absence of the ACL no notch forms. So there's a vestigial ACL seen there in the center and there is absolutely no notch. In this cadaveric section below there is a normal ACL. PCL is in the back, ACL is in the front, and the normal notch is seen. We looked radiographically at sizes of notch, looking at sex and sizes of notch there were no sex differences. Smaller notch and ratios were resulted in a greater ACL tear rate. This was at a study that we wrote up in the references down below. So it's not a sex difference. It's more of a size of the ACL and subsequently the size of the notch that develops in response to the size of the ACL. 
Bony morphology, shape and size of the femoral condyles, the female knee, less wide and significant difference medial more than lateral femoral condyles in some of these studies that were more aimed at total joint surgeons. So beware of looking at this with further studies of femoral shape and size of the condyles. Tibial plateau geometry, there were no sex differences. However, in this article by Hashimi, two articles, there were greater risk of ACL tear if there was a decrease in the, mil, in the medial tibial plateau depth by a millimeter or there was an increase in the posterior slope by a degree. These are the odds ratio. To measure this slope, this is evolving, but now doing MRI scans is the best way to measure the slope. And we also need to look at the medial tibial plateau depth as well as lateral tibial plateau depth to see the, if the size of the tibial plateau matters. More to come on this in the future, I'm sure. Intrinsically, Data are insufficient to make any conclusive statement regarding menstrual cycle of knee laxity and on the rate of ACL injuries in females. So there is no indication to change females' participation, practice, or play based on when they're, where they are in their cycle. Cycles can be reported by history but even more importantly to know what the hormonal levels, saliva, urine, blood need to be done. The COL5A1 gene is associated with increased risk of ACL tears in females. This is from work done out of South Africa, Posthumus and Wilhelm Vandermeer. This is the gene that encodes the alpha-1 chain. It's type 1 collagen and ACL, type 5 collagen and Achilles tendon injuries. And early work shows that this gene is associated with increased risk of ACL tears. We're not sure what to do with this information, but further work will be forthcoming. This is normal individuals doing mini squat maneuvers. Look at the male on the left. The pelvis is in neutral. Hip is neutral without rotation. He has no varus valgus at his knee. Tibia is in neutral. His foot is flat, back's flat, pelvis is in neutral. If you look at the female from the front and the side view all the way to the right, she has a Trendelenburg with a contralateral drop, internal rotation adduction of the hip. This drives her knee into valgus. Tibia is in external rotation so that she stays upright. Foot is pronated. She's more lordotic with an anterior tilt. So this places her in a position that's hard to get out of or this position of no return and increases risk of ACL injury if she lands like this, particularly upright and on one foot. Hypermobility or excessive joint laxity associated with increased incidence of musculoskeletal injury, not specifically ACL injury. What about extrinsically? Tim Hewitt and his co-workers have done a lot of work on landing patterns in females in the lab kinematically. Females have valgus collapse and increased knee abduction moment. In 205 females, there were nine ACL tears, and this greater abduction moment predicted ACL injury. So if we can do some screening of individuals, see if they have this greater abduction moment, and train them with balance training, hip strengthening, proper position of landing, then hopefully there would be reduced risk of injury in these individuals. The key is to find those that are at risk. The goal is also to make it easier to do this by doing mini squat maneuvers, seeing which patient 
does tend to have that valgus position or the position of no return and counsel them on what they need to do. Chappell and Garrett did a study comparing the knee kinematics between male and female recreational athletes in stop jump tasks. These were the tasks that were done, forward jump, vertical jump, backward jump. And women had greater knee extension and valgus moments, which would create more stress on the ACL in that backward jump stop. So there were some sex differences in these specific stop jump tasks in females. Is decision making different for ACL management based on sex? No, there should be no difference in treatment by healthcare professionals, no difference in decision to reconstruct ACL and graft choice, and there is no difference when we ask females about their desire to compete and win and their desire to get back in these elite level athletes. This Tennessee basketball athlete will tell you what she thinks about ACL injuries and basketball. I can take the pain and I can take the hurt, you know, because I'm so competitive and I, I, don't, I wouldn't care. You know, I would tear my ACL, you know, just to win a national championship. That's all I want. I respect her enthusiasm and I treat her just like any other patient, male or female. There are some special consideration in females, particularly in shorter, smaller females. This shorter individual, such as a gymnast cheerleader, has a shorter femoral condyle, so you must think about adjusting the fixation accordingly. You can use a, an absorbable HA interference screw or an endo button on the femur. This is a 16-year-old, 5 feet 2, 106 pounder. When I put her metal interference screw in, I don't routinely get x-rays. Everything looks great. Her first post-op visit, when I do get x-rays, you can see the interference screw on the femur is well past the lateral cortex and creating an iatrogenic IT band syndrome. So in her, we ended up leaving the screw for nine months and then took the screw out and she got a lot better since she didn't have a piece of metal on her IT band, a true reason for IT band syndrome. So the graft choice, there are no sex differences. Don't change based on cosmetic concerns. And the pearls are in that shorter, smaller femoral femur patient use suspension, use an endo button or biabsorbable and avoid this problem. She was very happy after we took that screw out, and I haven't seen her since. Stay Stable knee. Orthopedic surgeons can stabilize the knee, but not restore it to pre-injury state. We like to think we can make everything normal, but can we really? We need to rethink biologic healing and timing of return to play. It's variable due to multiple factors, the athlete, the sport they're going back to, try to recreate that homeostasis as best we can, that mosaic plasty of the knee, but realize that in a case like this with an unstable meniscus tear, we really can't recreate the knee to its normal pre-injury state. Development of osteoarthritis, the Swedish registry had 84 soccer athletes, 12-year follow-up, 42% of them had symptomatic knee osteoarthritis. 75% symptoms affected quality of life. There was no difference in the Swedish registry in these soccer athletes if they underwent ACL reconstruction compared to those who had not. This is pretty sobering, shocking news when you look at these individuals. Doesn't matter if you operated them, stabilized them or not, they developed arthritis. So in our country, we really need to develop ACL registries, follow these patients up, be better able to tell the patients in our own hands we should create our own registries if this is possible, if the funding is there and the personnel is there, which unfortunately it's not. 
our own registry will be able to counsel patients on how likely they are to get arthritis, should they go back and play, what are the risks of going back and play. Certainly we don't want them to re-tear their ACL, but really the more concerning problem is symptomatic osteoarthritis will develop later on. This is a individual two years after her ACL reconstruction. I had seen her previously for patellofemoral osteoarthritis on her opposite knee. And so two years after ACL reconstruction, she has tricompartment osteoarthritis. She tore ACL when she was 38 and had been playing basketball for most of her life. Perhaps she has some pack years involved and that knee was pre-arthritic before she tore ACL. We don't really know. Markers for osteoarthritis, bisynovial fluid, by scanning, would be helpful to identify the pre-arthritic patient. Maybe she did play basketball for too long a period of time similar to pack years of smoking. Maybe her athletic pack years had additive effect of years of participation on basketball, and maybe she had too many pack years of basketball. We tried to get an outcome registry in 2000. We weren't able to get adequate follow-up. It's hard to follow these patients up because the number one age, most commonly reconstructed knee, is a 15-year-old female. We'd studied, discontinued the study because of uh, lack of uh, being able to get these kids back. We should work together on projects, keep asking questions, dig deeper. I strongly feel doing ACL reconstructions is indicated in individuals who are active and young. However, I would like to have a better answer for these individuals of the rate of getting osteoarthritis. I try to follow these individuals every year with standing radiographs. We need to develop registries within our state about who is tearing ACLs, follow up, who develops arthritis, what their quality of living is, what do they go back to after an ACL reconstruction so that we can better counsel our patients on what to do and what to expect with their ACL reconstructed knee. It's not a major injury, but it is a quality of life changing injury for these young athletes. Would it help for individuals to delay longer going back after ACL reconstructions? The emphasis is always, I've got to get back for that showcase. I have to get back in four months, but it may make more sense to delay return to ACL risk activities. This is an article by Hewitt and his co-workers suggesting that two years after ACL reconstructions, patients are less likely for a second ACL injury, more likely to regain knee joint biologic health and function, and the question is, would this delay the development of osteoarthritis? This is an individual who's seven months after right ACL reconstruction. She had a normal exam, stable, full active and passive range of motion. But when we put her in the lab, we've got the pelvis overlay there. You can see where her pelvis is anteriorly rotated. It's her right knee. She doesn't extend her right knee nor hip as much as the opposite side. So visualize the forces going through her knee since the range of motion is less. And now she has this functional Trendelenburg when she lands on the right side. Watch her left pelvis drop. Lands on the left side. Her pelvis stays neutral. Lands there. So there is continuing abnormal forces going through that knee even though she's stable. And perhaps this, since the gait mechanics and running mechanics are never restored, she develops arthritis because of that. A little shocking to see what the gait analysis looks like after she's been cleared for soccer activities.
Brian Noren at the Biomotion Lab at the University of Kentucky does some great research, and we are always looking for individuals who will volunteer their time and needs for us to evaluate. So this is his contact information, B. Noren at uky.edu. Please contact us if you have ACL patients or patients who have abnormal gait and you want them assessed. So when we're analyzing gait, we look at balance and strength. Who should our comparison groups be? Should we have normal controls versus post-ACL reconstruction? The uninjured leg in the ACL reconstructed patient is not normal, so we need to do a little bit more work on seeing if we need normal controls, which in our lab we are finding is a better control as opposed to the uninjured leg because that one is abnormal if somebody tore one ACL. What are the objective measurements of hip, trunk, gait, balance? We need to work more on these. What are the best tests to do? We do functional tests of movement patterns to see if patients are confident in their movement patterns. And they really tell us if the patient is ready or not. And the patient knows that when they are put through some of these drills where they're stopping, cutting, changing direction. Still need to work on what are the best tests to do. Work with your therapist, athletic trainers, of what tests to do. You can't do all the tests, but what they feel are the best tests. There remains a paucity of objective criteria and consensus guidelines to facilitate the decision of return to play after ACL reconstruction. More emphasis on psych psychologic state, kinesiophobia, or fear of re-injury. We need a reliable consensus guidelines with objective and subjective return prior to return to play. We need these subjective criteria. If somebody's scared of going back to play, they're probably going to get hurt. Maybe not their same ACL, but they'll hurt something. This is a recent JAS publication of return to play following ACL reconstruction by Elman and others. Janelle Pearson, high school soccer athlete, in this article, New York Times, The Uneven Playing Field. This patient had multiple ACL injuries, both knees, and this is what she thought after her surgeries. Her mindset was rehab hard, get back on the field, compete fiercely, and hope not to be injured. This hope not to be injured, we've got to do better with that. She needs the confidence to say she's not going to be re-injured and the ability to confidently move on these knees. If she doesn't develop that, she probably shouldn't go back to play, particularly after multiple ACL surgeries. It's hard for us as orthopedists to tell somebody they can't go back to their sport, but we also have to be the protector of that individual and not allow her to abuse herself and end up with a very unfortunate arthritis in a very young individual. This is a very interesting interview with Katie Kay, who is the author of The Confidence Code. There are sex differences in girls and boys. Children are not little adults. Girls and boys are not alike, and that's a good thing. But I find it interesting what she talks about the confidence code in rearing our girls, and I think it's something that is important for the girls to hear as well as parents. We have this idea that if we keep our heads down and we play by the rules and we're just good girls, our natural talents will be rewarded. And then we've watched as the guys have got promoted over us mm -hmm. and pay rises over us. And actually, I think women need to redefine talent to include confidence. Mm -hmm. It's an important part of the game for us. Mm -hmm. And you talk about tips for boosting confidence. Fail fast when in doubt. Act. Don't ruminate. Rewire. We talked about that. And it's not personal. And in terms of raising our girls, very important. I think we need to start this idea that girls have to be good girls. You and I have no. spoken about this, you, Gail. You said encourage them to be less good, encourage them to be a little bad. That a was such a contradiction bad. to me. You know, girls are brought up always to be good, and they get rewarded for being good. And then, you know, to ask for that pay raise or to go for that promotion, 
you have to be prepared to rock the boat. You can't people please all you the mean, time. Be prepared to take the risk or to be bad. Prepared what does to be take bad the mean? risk and to fail. To, you have to be prepared to stick your neck out a bit, yeah. to do things that may not make every single person in the room happy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important lesson for our girls and something that we parents can pass on to them. And maybe we men can learn. Uh, yes, and I have specifically for you, Charlie, a confidence test <laughs> on our test. website. <laughs> and I want to know the results later. So parents can be a bit pushy, as this father tells his young girl, now get out there, Jennifer, and kill. It's true. Sometimes it's very difficult. The parents can be a bit mean when kids get injured. And we need to protect these children from injuring themselves more. Have them regain confidence before going back and playing, in addition to regaining a normal knee physically and the ability to run normally, cut with confidence. Thank you very much for your attention. This is a water buck in Africa and our UK sports medicine team. Thank you for your attention. This is my website where this and other videos are posted. So please visit this, and I hope this helps you.